Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to talk about a small Python library called PyGFilter. And the idea of the talk is um, easing up geospatial filtering. Um, first, a little bit about me. I'm Fabian Schindler. I work for a small Austrian company called UX, and we are dealing with geospatial data, earth observation data, and um, geospatial services. You can check out our homepage. Um, <clears throat> as already mentioned, PyGFilter is a Python package, so it's pure Python um, to parse geospatial filters and apply them to storages. Um, this sounds really abstract, um, so I'm going to start with uh, explaining a little bit more about the actual problem. So the actual problem is uh, you have a store of geospatial metadata or data and you have stored records there and then you want to want to use this to perform geospatial queries. Mm, maybe not simple queries like some simple uh, filters with values but maybe some more complex filters. And you also don't want to expose your system uh, to, to the public. Maybe you don't want to other, other people to, to actually change the records on your system without, without, um, without any security. So you just want to limit them to querying. Uh, there are a couple of um, filtering standards. So for example, we have the venerable OGC filters, which are XML-based. You can see here, you can see here. You can see here, the, this is how you would define a, a compound filter. You have the end filter keyword. Here you compare a property with a specific value that you provided. And you can also make a spatial query and uh, with some, some envelope. And then you will combine them all with the end keyword. So this is XML based. It's rather heavy handed and um, verbose as you can see. Um, but there are other query filtering languages as well. So for example, as, as, as we have seen already, with the SQL text, SQL text is uh, part of the, the catalog specification. And as you can see here, it's basically the same functionality, but now you have it in a SQL-like filtering language. It's, it's more, much, much, much less verbose. And it's also quite expressive, but in the end, it's actually su supports the same concepts uh, as, the, as the OGC filter. There's also now uh, the SQL2JSON, which is the same filters that we have seen in the, in the earlier one. So basically this, the same um, semantics behind it are now expressed in JSON. You can do the same things. You can do geospatial queries, you can do temporal queries, you can combine them with AND and OR and so on. So you again have the same functionality as before, but and again encoded in a different standard. Um, there's also a nice thing I, I really like, it's the JSON filter expressions, which is another JSON format. Now it's not uh, CQL, but it's a different format. It's kind of a Lisp style, so you have the operator before and then you have the operand afterwards. It's, I think it's quite expressive, but again, it's just another filtering language to do exactly the same things as with the other filtering languages we had before. So again, you have geospatial queries, you have value queries, you can combine them with ands and ors and whatever. Um, so they have very similar concepts. They allow you to access the attributes of your records. They allow you to specify as, as predicates usually spatially, temporal, and other ones. And then you have logical combinators. But the encoding is very different, and if you want to support more than one, you basically have to write your own um, parser for everyone and, and apply them to your, to your business logic, um, which is hard. This is, again, even compounded with, with the fact that there is many, many, many backends that you can actually then apply these filters to. So you have search engines like Elasticsearch, you have uh, higher level frameworks like SQL Alchemy or Django. You can also make low level queries for uh, SQLite or PostgreSQL. And even GDAL has its own uh, SQL um, interface that you could use. And then there's also like uh, other, other things like GeoPandas. You can have a local data frame that you might also want to filter. Or you can have an OSQL database like MongoDB. So again, we have very, very uh, diverse set of uh, backends that you can actually uh, apply the filters to that, you, that drives your application. Um, 
and switching from one to the other is, is again a, a huge task. Maybe you want it, maybe you want to support more than one because you want your users to, to configure them. Um, so again, there, there's a huge variety of, 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 um, of backends available. And this is actually where PyGeoFilter comes in. So it, on the one hand, it is a filter language parser for all the standards that we have seen before. And it is an adapter for the backends, basically all the backends that you have seen here. It is available on GitHub. Um, pull requests are welcome. Um, and how does it actually work? So it actually works with the concept that I've, I've explained before. On the top, we have the, the the green bars are basically all the filtering languages that are supported. And on the bottom, the, the blue items are the backends that we apply uh, the filters to. And in the middle, we have uh, the thing called an AST. This is a term borrowed from actual uh, computer language parsing. So for example, a C parser or whatever language parser usually has the concept of an abstract syntax tree. The abstract syntax tree come back to it later so okay so the the, the front end parser actually has the has the has the responsibility of turning whatever is 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 parsed passed by the by the service into this AST and on, in in some cases for example in the XML filters we can actually build on on parsers already available so we can parse the XML and then construct our AST from that um, for JSON, it's also quite easy. But for example, when we have the SQL text, we have to write our own parser. This is where we are using the Lark framework. Lark is a really nice framework where you can define your uh, grammar in a BNF form, and then you can parse out your AST that way. Okay, I wanted to start on the on the, the abstract syntax tree uh, beforehand. As we said, this is a term board for the actual uh, programming language parsing, uh, and it is basically a representation of the filters in an abstract format. And for us, it means it is uh, the, the, most, uh, the least common denominator of all the parsing languages that we actually support. And every node expresses a single filtering operation. As the name implies, it is a tree structure. So we start from a, from a root node, and then we have a tree structure. I will, I will give an example on, on that. And then there are several node types. Some are for uh, combining or negating. Some are for predicates. Some are for property access. Some are of even for arithmetic operations. You can also add function calls, or you can have input values. So for example, if you want to compare uh, that you only want to get the records which are inside of a specific bounding box. Uh, the bounding box is the input value. Okay, now we finally have an example. So this is a, a query written in the SQL programming as a SQL query language. Um, we want to get all the records which have a population uh, lower than 50, or we have a name compared to some, some regular expression, and are intersecting with the geometry. So it's a complex query. We have also some parentheses to group uh, several expressions into, into a single one. And then we have a combinator to combine them. Uh, we have the OR combinator in this group, and we have the AND combinator in the, in the second group. And so how does this look like uh, when we construct an abstract syntax tree? It actually looks like this. So the, the root node would be the, the AND. And then we have the first group in the parentheses, which is basically the, the left side of this whole tree. And on the other hand, we have the right side of the tree, which is just uh, the, the right-hand side of the intersects. So the intersect here. I try to color code it to make it a little bit more obvious what is happening. So with the green ones are the, the, the logical combinators. The blue ones are the predicates. The yellow ones are the property accesses. And the red ones are the actual values. So here, for example, we are comparing with, uh, with the literal value 50, which is, a, which is an actual value. And here we also have like a geometry that we are comparing to, which is also um, a value that is passed in. Right. So this is all, it's also possible, for, for whatever reason, you want to construct an abstract syntax tree in Python. You can simply do that. It's a simple module, and there's, there's just objects that you combine. So for example, we have here have a geometry within 
um, predicates and you, you pass in the left hand side and the right hand side. The left hand side is the first argument, the right hand side is the second argument. The left hand side is just an attribute access and we want to access the utter attribute. And on the right hand side we are simply passing in a, a geometry in which we want to compare it to. Okay, so this is how we construct an abstract syntax tree, but now what we can, act, can we actually do with it? Um, here's the concept of a backend and the evaluator. So they're very close to each other. The backend is, is what we call, is, is actually the implementation. So for example, your Elasticsearch service, so this is your backend. And the evaluator is the piece sitting in between the, in between the backend and the AST. Um, why do we need, need that? We need to transform the AST to something that the backend understands. So each backend functions uh, completely differently. So for example, PostgreSQL requires SQL queries. Um, Elasticsearch has a JSON construct defining the query and so on. So for, every, for everything that you have a, a, a different set of, of, of filters or, or filter language and so on. And this is very, very much um, it varies a great deal, so for each you need basically a plugin to, to, to deal with this particular backend. Also, it's important to note that not all the backends support all AST types, so especially in the spatial, um, in the spatial theme, there not, not every query mechanism might be supported. So for example, uh, MongoDB only has a limited set of spatial queries that you can actually perform. So it's not possible to translate the whole set of the AST nodes to that particular backend. Some are more conformant, so for example, PostgreSQL basically supports everything, but uh, some backends are lacking in that regard. And this is, this is fine, you just need to know about it and you need to handle accordingly. Because you have chosen your backend for a specific set of requirements, and if you know them, uh, it's also possible to access them using uh, the, the filters. Um, we, so PyJ filter already has a, a set of, of built-in backend uh, connectors. So we have one for Django, we have one for SQL Alchemy, we have one for Elasticsearch, MongoDB. There's also one for generic SQL. Generic SQL is, is quite powerful because you can, you can pass it on to, uh, to many different backends. So for example, you can also use it for the, uh, for the GDAL API. Um, so you can have basically access to many, many, many different uh, um, backends again through, through GDAL. Um, currently there's a caveat uh, because we're targeting GDAL. Uh, it is not possible to to properly separate the input values from, from the query, which is usually done in order to, to, pre, um, in order to limit SQL injection attacks. So this, is, so this should be used with caution. We also have the, the GeoPandas backends. So for example, when you have a local GeoPandas data frame, you can uh, create your filters and apply them to your local GeoPandas data frame. We also have a native backend, so you have an iterator or you have a list of local Python objects in, in your code that you want to filter, you can also do that. There are also some, some um, special backends, uh, one is for CKL2JSON. The idea behind that is that we actually use a front-end, so a front-end language again as a target, so we get uh, any AST that from, from any filtering language, and we can encode that again into SQL2JSON. Um, so it's actually, it's Apache filter is now a translator between two filtering standards. Um, this is used, I think, in the planetary computer by Microsoft, because their system only understands SQL2JSON. Uh, so this is why this is translated using Apache filter, um, and it, it actually performs its task really well. There's also the next uh, special backend, which is the optimization one. Uh, in, in order, we can, we can do some static analysis on your abstract syntax tree in order to make it more simple. And some, some cases, we can even cut out parts of the abstract syntax tree entirely. Um, usually, this is done by, by backends, and they are more performant. And this is not really used anywhere unless you're using the native backend. Right. Um, this is how you would use it in code. So this, for this example, I used uh, a MongoDB. Um, so we connect to MongoDB, we uh, select the database and the collection, then we are parsing um, um, a SQL query to an abstract syntax tree. 
Uh, this is where we then make the actual evaluation. So we simply pass it to a function called to filter, which is from the MongoDB backend uh, module. What we get back is a filter. Um, we can then transform the filter yet again. So we, if we have expert knowledge about the backend, we can, we can make changes to that or extend it with other filters. And then we simply pass it on to, to, the, to the collection or to, to MongoDB, which is the actual filtering work, and we get back our results. Um, if you have a backend that is not represented on this list, it's, right, it's rather easy to roll your own evaluator. Um, this is done also using Python. You simply um, inherit from a specific uh, base class, and then you can, with decorators, declare which uh, abstract syntax tree node you want to you want to uh, adopt in this function, and then you simply write a small function that translates this abstract syntax tree node into whatever is required for your backend. There's also a catch all, which is this adopt function, which is called if, if none of the of the others have uh, if, if if this if this particular node was not uh, handled by by the others. Right. Um, finally, some projects that are using PyGFilter already. Uh, so PyCSW, we have already heard. Um, also, our own uh, geospatial data service called UX service using it. There's also, um, in the sphere of the planetary computer by Microsoft, there's also a project called OGC API Fast Features, which is using it. Um, yeah, and I, I hear some rumors that it's going to be used in even more projects, so I'm really proud. This whole project is now just, um, I'd, I'd say, two years old, so it's, it's rather new. Um, if you find it interesting, please um, write issues, contribute, discussions, pull requests, everything is welcome. Yes, uh, I'd like to say thank you for your uh, attendance and your attention, and questions are welcome.